Okay, folks, it's uh, about 7 o'clock, so I'm going to go ahead and get things started as people are still trickling in and introducing themselves. Uh, welcome to the Farminar. This is our first Farminar of the year. I'm excited to kick things off tonight with Jill Bebout. Uh, I'm Steve Carlson. I'm a staff member at Practical Farmers of Iowa. Um, and tonight is, as I mentioned, the first Farminar of our fall series. And so I'm going to start off real quick and talk a little bit about um, our Farminar series, introduce Jill, and um, a little bit about PFI before I turn it over to her. So tonight we're talking about growing in high tunnels. And PFI farmer Jill Bebout of Blue Gate Farm is leading tonight's presentation. And Jill farms with her husband, Sean Skihan, in Marion County. It's in south central Iowa, where they raise certified naturally grown produce, laying hens, honeybees, uh, hay, and alpacas. And Jill has over 10 years' experience with high tunnel production and has participated in several research projects with PFI. Um, and, and she's collected data through these research projects on growing crops in high tunnels. So not only has she been growing in high tunnels, but just she's been paying good attention to what's been working and what hasn't, and so she'll share a lot of that with us tonight. Um, if you want to actually look at the research projects that Jill, that Jill has been uh, a part of, you can go to the Research Reports Archive on our website. I'll put that in the chat box here. And then in the Research Reports Archive, you can just search for Jill's last name, Bebout, or search for High Tunnels or Blue Gate Farm, and it'll pull up all of the uh, all of the research projects that she's been a part of. So there's the hyperlink in the chat box there if you want to look for that stuff. So um, these far this Farminar series, this is every Tuesday night, and this fall series goes through December 20th, and then uh, then we're going to start a winter series on January 10 with another 12. Farm and our topics. So this is just one third of the list right here. Um, it's a really diverse group of speakers and diverse group of topics. So um, this is what we've got going through December 20th. Uh, if you happen to miss one of these live farminars, we do record each one of these and we archive them at the link there on the screen um, in our farminar archive. And we've been doing this for years. We have over a hundred farminars in our archives. So a lot of interesting stuff to dig through in there if you ever get a chance. So if you do miss one though, you can go there and check it out, or if you want a, a recap of what you did participate in, you can find it there as well. So a little bit about Practical Farmers of Iowa. Our organization started back in 1985. PFI is a nonprofit organization made up of farmers and friends of farmers, and our farmers come from farms of all sizes and all enterprises from across the state and far beyond the state. We've got members um, all around the Midwest and then on, you know, really all, all across the United States. So if you're not a, a farmer in Iowa, uh, you still can reap a lot of benefits from our organization um, by being a member. Our mission at Practical Farmers of Iowa is strengthening farms and communities through farmer-led investigation and information sharing. And this mission allows us to to help farmers practice an agriculture that benefits both the land and the people. Our values at PFI are welcoming everyone, creativity, collaboration, and community, viable farms now and for future generations, and stewardship and ecology. As I mentioned, we are a member-based organization and some of the benefits of joining um, it really is the, the main benefit is our network of members, our network of farmers and friends of farmers. Um, as a member, you get access to our very helpful email discussion lists. Um, you get our quarterly newsletters, discounts to our events. We hold uh, dozens and dozens of, of um, on-farm events and workshops um, throughout the year. And then you get the opportunity as a member to participate in research projects like Jill has. Um, also, in all of our programming, we have a lot of different beginning farmer uh, programs that you can participate in as a member. There's a lot more information about um, joining PFI on our website, so I encourage you to look into that. So, although we are entering into our farm and our season, which is typically kind of the off-season for many um, enterprises in agriculture, 
we've still got a few on-farm field days planned this month. We do those throughout the year, and this time of year is when we do a lot of uh, cover crop on-farm field days. So we have an event page where we list all PFI events and then a bunch of partner um, events as well. So if you hit that event page, there's always something going on, um, November, December, January, any month of the year. So if you're looking for something to do for another learning opportunity, check out that event page. And speaking of events, we've got um, the big cheese of PFI events in January, our annual conference. And this year it is January 20th and 21st. It's always in Ames, Iowa. And um, we actually just this last week released our booklet, which um, lists more than more than 50 sessions that we've got planned for this year's conference. Um, it's you know mostly farmer-led. Um, there are workshops and sessions for farmers of all skill levels, um, all enterprises, just a ton of really fantastic opportunities to network and to meet other Iowa farmers, and, and farmers come from out of state as well. So I highly encourage you to check this out. It's a wonderful learning opportunity, um, and think about joining us here in Ames in January. So a couple of housekeeping things real quick. Uh, like I mentioned before, if you want to stay in touch with PFI's Farminars, you can provide us uh, with your email address in the chat box, and uh, we'll send you a weekly email during the Farminars season, just about a recap from the previous week and what's coming up the, the coming week. And because it's fun to see where folks are tuning in from, uh, go ahead and enter your location in the chat box. It's fun to see. We've already um, noticed some people from all across the U.S. here. So thank you for, um, for doing that. Also in that bottom left corner of your screen, if you haven't noticed that, we have a little poll that helps us track how many people tune in. So if there are a few of you watching from one computer, um, please indicate that in our little poll so we can kind of just get a head count. Um, so before I give it over to Jill here, I just want to mention I hope to save plenty of time tonight for questions. So be thinking of questions as we go along. Um, and you can type those into the chat box really at any time. But um, if Jill doesn't see your question or if it doesn't really make sense to answer that at this at the time that you ask it, then I'll make sure we circle back around at 8 o'clock. She'll talk till roughly 8 and then we'll save you know 20, 30 minutes for questions afterwards. So um, be thinking of your questions. That's what the chat box is for. We want this to be interactive. Um, and if we miss your question, we'll get back to it. And then one final thing is that um, when we near the end of the farm hour, I'm going to post a link um, on the screen for you to take a very short survey about the farm hour. So please take just a quick minute after the presentation to give us a little bit of feedback. But thank you everyone for tuning in. I'm going to pull up Jill's presentation here, and and then once this is up, she'll be taking it over. Good evening. I'm hoping everyone can hear me and I'm not too loud. Somebody give me a heads up if we need to adjust the volume tonight. Um, as Steve said, and thank you Steve for the lovely introduction and for getting things rolling for us this evening. Um, my name is Jill Bebout. I farm here in South Central Iowa with my husband Sean. And we uh, we are not lifelong farmers. We, we come from rather a strange background. We've were professional theater employees for a number of years so um, we came at farming from kind of a different perspective and I think that's given us some interesting insight and also some um, possibly unreasonable expectations when we move to the farm so uh, we we are kind of a strange beast in in South Central Iowa um, we are certified naturally grown on our farm. We have a, about a 50 member CSA. We're one delivery into our winter CSA, which is a much smaller CSA. Um, but that's where the majority of our produce is going at this time of the year. Although this weekend we are at the downtown Des Moines Farmers Market for our first of the indoor markets. So uh, though the high tunnels have not been quite so necessary in this crazy warm fall weather, we are just about to move into harvesting from those for the fall. 
So we built our first high tunnel, um, as you can see there on the left in 2006. That was our second season on the farm. We've been there since 2005. And our first two tunnels were both farm tech tunnels. They're here in the state of Iowa, so shipping was a little more reasonable. Um, and we didn't know a whole lot about high tunnels at that point. So uh, going with a local company seemed like a good option. Um, all of our construction has been done in-house between Sean and myself and my dad. And in the photo there on the left, you can also see my 95-year-old grandfather giving us a hand with that, with that first tunnel. Um, We've had some issues with high tunnels, which also gives us an interesting perspective. Um, as I said, that first tunnel went up in 2006. In May of 2008, uh, we had a small tornado start just west of our farm and um, remove that tunnel for us. So high tunnels were important to us enough at that point that we put up a replacement tunnel and then expanded into uh, a larger tunnel as you can see on the right side of the photo um, which was also a farm tech and that was a 42 by 48 um, our need going with those oh I just saw our that first tunnel the measurements are wrong that should be 26 by 48 not 28 um, We've gone with the half-length tunnels historically on our farm because, contrary to popular belief, Iowa is not flat where we live, and we don't have nice flat ground to, to put a 96-foot tunnel up, so we have had to go with the shorter length ones um, on our farm, and that, that historically has worked okay. Uh, this would be uh, the next type of... Uh, high tunnel. We did recently acquire some new ground that allowed us some flat land, so we put up our third high tunnel, um, and this was a Knowltz tunnel that uh, is a 30 by 96, and we actually just finished that. That photo on the bottom right is uh, about four days old, so this tunnel is brand new for us, and we're just rolling into, into production with those. So um, we've had some experience putting up a number of high tunnels, and unfortunately we've had some experience taking them down, too. Um, some of the things that, uh, that we found in putting up different, constri or different models of high tunnel is, boy, it sure helps to know someone who's put up that brand of tunnel, and if you can have somebody on the ground with you if you're putting it up in-house, um, who has put up that manufacturer's tunnel, it is incredibly helpful. It's also very helpful to have willing friends. Our high tunnels, like I said, have been in production since 2006. We do grow 11 months of the year in them. Um, we're generally fallow the month of March as we turn over from our overwintered crops into our spring crops, um, but we do grow nearly year-round in them. And you can see in the right photo there, those are our first two, our earlier two farm tech tunnels. This is our newest tunnel. This is the Knoltz uh, 30 by 96 tunnel. And uh, that one was just, like I said, just planted out this week. So we've got a little more experience growing in our uh, construction on the, uh, the other manufacturer and larger high tunnel. Uh, some some quick photos of our high tunnels growing. We do grow very intensively in our high tunnels. Um, like I said, we do 11 months of the year. We generally give them a three-month rotation. And uh, so we'll go from an early spring crop, roll over to warm weather crops. Generally, the first week in October, we clear them, roll over to cool weather crops again. And those we harvest from, like I said, usually until March when we strip them out, do some soil renovation, and get them ready for spring crops again. This is the unfortunate side of high tunnel. Like I said, the, the uh, presentation is the good, the bad, and the ugly. This is the ugly. And uh, we've had way more ugly on our farm than most people have. Um, like I said, that first tornado that came through in 2008 uh, just pancaked 
that first tunnel. Um, it came from the west, which was the short end of the tunnel, and it just it just laid it down and wound it up. And I have to tell you that uh, uh, taking a high tunnel apart when it's in this shape is a lot harder than putting one up. It was a giant pain. Um, then we got to, to do it again. This last November, there was a small tornado uh, that, uh, I guess a year ago, uh, that came up and went on to take the roof off our local Walmart. It evidently started at our place, and we had no idea anything had happened. It happened overnight, and we woke up the next morning to the picture on the right. It took the entire tunnel, flipped it over, and flipped it into the field next door. Um, so those pipes that you see sticking up, those used to be in the ground. It pulled them completely out of the ground, lifted the whole thing airborne, and went over. That was not a good day. Um, but high tunnels have been important enough that, that we, we keep putting them back up again. Hence the Nolts Tunnel that we just added this past week. Um, there are, besides having them flip upside down, there are a lot of challenges with high tunnels. Um, probably our greatest challenges have been insects. Uh, when I talk to people about high tunnels, I often tell them that high tunnels magnify everything, both the good and the bad. And when something goes wrong in a high tunnel, it goes bad fast, furious, and can be catastrophic almost overnight. Um, so scouting and watching in a high tunnel, that, that daily intensive management is much more important uh, from my perspective than it is in the field. Um, some insects that we've had significant issue with in our tunnels include white fly and aphids, um, which I think are kind of a problem for a lot of people growing under undercover. Um, flea beetle, grasshoppers, and army worms have, have recently become a problem for us. Um, we are a 100% chemical free farm, so obviously we have uh, some limits as far as what we can do to, to control a lot of those um, little lovelies. Uh, Tanglefoot traps are something that, that we have used moderately successfully on the farm. Basically you take a two cup cottage cheese container and you paint the outside of it with Tanglefoot, um, the sticky beeswax um, substance. And then you fill the container with water, and um, when nights are cooler, the water stays warmer and it attracts the insects to the heat. Uh, and we were, we were, I would say, a somewhat successful with flea beetles on those. Um, they were also really unfortunate if you got them too close to the plants, and then you had tanglefoot stuck to your eggplants and everything else. But, um, but it was a very um, non-invasive trap. It did, of course, trap all of our beneficials as well, so you do have to use them with some caution. Um, we have spent a, a fair amount of time manually removing insects, which for larger farms probably isn't an issue, uh, but armyworm or um, uh, tomato hornworm, when we've gotten them in the tunnels, we've just gone through and manually removed them. Um, Bt has been fairly helpful for us only on our fruiting crops. We don't spray our greens crops with that. Um, and like in the field row cover, um, as an exclusion, uh, are, the thing we find with row cover in the high tunnel as an excluder is that um, once the bugs get in, then you're just really providing them a very nice bed and breakfast where they can hang out and be cozy. But it, it does work for a period of time. Um, diseases can also be a significant issue in tunnels. Um, we have not had much disease pressure, uh, although that the bottom photo would, would say otherwise. Um, molds and mildews tend to be more of an issue than, you know, say anthracnose or some of those problems. In our experience, we very aggressively rotate our crops in our high tunnels. Our tunnels all are on four-foot permanent beds, um, and uh, making sure that we never have uh, similar crop families in the same soil closer than three rotations has helped us with that, although those crops are all still very close together in an enclosed space. So um, if we see anything that we're concerned about, we try and get it out of the tunnel and not just drop it on the paths. Uh, we do try to keep the air circulation as active as we can in our tunnels, both by uh, 
using the roll-up sides and um, we also use uh, ceiling fans in our tunnels and that seems to help quite a bit as well. Some of the other challenges, um, I kind of feel like we've had all of them. You can see some really ugly uh, leaf deformation in that top right photo um, and some fairly ugly chlorosis in the bottom photo. Um, we thought we were struggling with a salinization problem in our high tunnels. Uh, we'd been in production in them for 10 years and we were seeing some real problems, especially in our solanum crops. And uh, we did soil tests, we talked to experts and they told us we had a salinization problem and other experts told us we didn't have a salinization problem. And I have a theater degree, you know, they didn't require soil science um, to uh, to graduate with a theater degree from college, so I'm kind of at the mercy of, of some of the experts. Soil science is not my not my expertise, so when the uh, when the experts don't agree, with looking at your soil test results, it kind of leaves you floating out there on your own. Um, we were fairly aggressively foliar feeding to try and uh, bring the plants through this problem. We use uh, liquid fish and seaweed. We also amend the soil with uh, granular uh, fish and seaweed as well. Um, we were making comfrey smoothies because we thought that we had a potassium deficiency and comfrey is fairly high in potassium. Uh, we were drenching with comfrey and the plants survived. They continued to produce but they just weren't weren't quite right. Um, it took us about two and a half, three years of having this problem escalate to finally determine that we were underwatering, and uh, that that was the farmer feeling really stupid. Um, but because we were we were creating kind of a drought situation, it didn't allow the nutrient take up. So our soils were were showing great nutrient levels, but our plants were deficient. So uh, really knowing how much how much water you need to be running through those irrigation lines is fairly important, or you start seeing really ugly results. Um, we used to flush our beds uh, every year. We would do it during our during our high tunnel turnover in March, and we were generally laying down approximately three gallons of water per square bed foot, um, and only in those permanent beds. So it, it wasn't we weren't watering our pathways as well um, because we were trying to flush those salts. And our soil is fairly high clay content, so it. Uh, it retains some of those uh, salinity issues, or it exacerbates some of those salinity issues. Um, I'm not sure that the that the flooding was actually doing us any good, and in fact, we are we're no longer doing that. Um, sufficient irrigation and and really watching that situation seems to have uh, greatly improved our situation there. Some other challenges we've had with the high tunnels: varmints are terrible. Um, we're in a very high uh, ecologically active area. We're surrounded by timber and fields and the varmints are vicious. Uh, voles are our number one problem. Uh, rabbits are a ridiculous problem. We have dogs and I'm amazed at how much trouble rabbits actually give us in the high tunnel. Um, heat and venting is a challenge with high tunnels. People are high tunnels are passive solar and uh, so we're not adding supplemental heat, but I constantly tell people it is much harder to keep the high tunnels cool than it is to keep them warm. Uh, drainage can be a real problem in the high tunnels. We uh, are at the on the top of a hill, and still, when if we get into a heavy rain situation, the water shedding off the tunnels that can creep back in can be can be an issue. Um, we did put tile lines along the outsides of our high tunnels. Um, uh, the first two anyway, and I feel like that helped us, um, but we do occasionally still get some creep in when uh, we've been in a high rain situation. Um, stress on the structures, obviously depending on what area you're in, if you have um, a good wind break, we don't. So uh, the winds come up through our pasture, they ramp up the hill and they hit the short ends of those high tunnels and are, are pretty hard on them. Um, heavy snow and ice can be a problem. We generally uh, spend some time out knocking snow off ours in the winter. Uh, plastic can be punctured and that's generally um, 
a crew issue. I, I have to say that we've not had a problem with livestock or varmints puncturing our plastic, but give the crew a hoe and, and at some point you're, you're probably going to have your plastic punctured. Uh, and one of the biggest challenges is stress on the farmers. Um, uh, having the high tunnels is great, but uh, it's kind of like having a new baby in the house. You don't sleep nearly as well as you used to when you erect that first high tunnel. At least I certainly didn't. Uh, on the other hand, there are some fabulous high tunnel successes. Um, the picture top left is a uh, large leaf basil leaf uh, and that's the size of one of my crew members hand and uh, the the uh, certain varieties of basil in the high tunnel are spectacular and you can see the napa cabbage in the center photo that's my hand and i don't have dainty hands um, that was some of the most beautiful napa cabbage we had ever raised our winter crops um, the kale mix on the right even the summer crops, the quadrado peppers down below, the large pepper came from the high tunnel, the small pepper came from the field. Um, so some of those crops really take the advantage of the high tunnel, the controlled moisture, um, the control from the, the wind break, and really thrive in that situation. And I got to tell you that when it's zero degrees outside, um, if it's a sunny day, those high tunnels are the best place on the farm to be because they can be 80 degrees and sunny. This is a, just a quick snapshot of how fast we can turn a high tunnel over. This was um, our larger farm tech tunnel. And the picture on the left, last of the summer crops, this was the 15th of October. And the next picture is the next day. So we cleared our mid-season crops, turned it over into transplants and sown crops. And, uh, and we were ready to roll, and those crops started to be harvested uh, five weeks later. So that was, I, I really appreciate the turnover time that we have in those high tunnels. But like I said, they, they definitely magnify everything. Um, this is really the, the focus of what I wanted, wanted to, to uh, pay the most attention to on the farm and our this evening, is really the, the best ideas um, and later, the worst ideas we've had in our high tunnels. Um, I'm not an expert in high tunnels. I've been doing it for a little over 10 years. There are a lot of people out there, especially associated with some of the universities that are much smarter than I am and have much more scientific experience in high tunnels. But uh, I firmly believe that we can learn something from everyone. So so I want to share some of the things that we've, we've experienced. Um, the first thing, like I mentioned, those tanglefoot traps, and that's the, uh, the small picture to the right of the screen um, that looks like a cottage cheese container. Uh, that's a quick snapshot of our tanglefoot traps. Like I said, you do have to be, to be pretty careful. You don't want to trap all your ladybugs on there. Um, trellising and paneling in the high tunnel. Since this is high value real estate, you really want to be sure that you are taking advantage of all the space that you can in the tunnels. Um, so what we've done is in the uh, in the colossal tunnel, the larger of the farm tech tunnels, you can see on the lower left photo, that tunnel had an integral center wall of posts because it was so wide. And when we first put up that tunnel, I wasn't very excited about having those in my way because they hit the center of a bed. But we put uh, Portnova from Johnny's, um, seven foot tall, up on those center posts, and it made an incredibly stable place to always have trellised crops. So we would rotate through peas and cucumbers, and they'd alternate with tomatoes, um, and it was just a great place to take advantage of. In our smaller farm tech tunnel, we mounted livestock panels on the west wall, um, which is the short one of the short walls and went too high and that also makes an incredibly stable place for growing some of those vining crops so you can take advantage of that vertical use of space um, so taking advantage of, of any of those that you can is is great the next best idea that's in red is deer netting um, and it's in red because i've i've uh wavered back and forth on deer netting um, I mentioned that we were having problems with rabbits in our tunnels, 
and I was always very concerned about uh, skunks and some of the other critters that uh, live in our timber actually coming in the high tunnel and doing a lot of damage. Um, but during the summer, I really prefer to keep my high tunnel sides open all night. Uh, so we had installed, we had first installed deer netting um, under the roll-up side, or excuse me, bird netting under the roll-up sides, and it wasn't, it wasn't strong enough and it made a mess. So we replaced it with deer netting, which was much more structural. And in the straight-sided tunnels, um, the Gothic tunnels where your roll-up sides are truly vertical, though that seems to work incredibly well. You never have to worry about uh, critters coming in and out. Um, it also helps keep birds out, which I appreciate. Um, the problem with the round style, the Quonset style high tunnels, is that your roll-up sides are actually resting against your ribs, and they catch on that deer netting. And this year I actually had to go through with patch tape and patch our roll-up sides um, anywhere that they were rubbing against that because it caused an incredible amount of friction um, between those two plastic surfaces. So I'm kind of 50-50 on the deer netting currently. I would say if you've got those uh, those curved sides, if you can find a way, it's a pain in the butt. If you can find a way to put it on the inside of the ribs, it's probably still pretty effective, but I will no longer put it on the outside of the ribs um, on our, on our slope-sided tunnels. Um, shelving is probably the number one best thing that we've come up with in our high tunnel. Um, and as I said, I, I firmly believe you can, you can uh, learn from everyone, and we were a good example of that when a very large, um, well-educated uh, farmer and wife pair from New York State came to speak at a PFI conference a number of years ago, and they stayed at our farm. Um, and I, I was feeling pretty silly because we're pretty small potatoes when it comes to uh, large produce farms. And they were not very impressed with our farm um, until they got into our high tunnel and saw that shelving on the bottom right. And they got really excited about that. Um, so I, I felt a little bit redeemed. The way that that shelving works, it's just the, the normal Rubbermaid brand wire shelving that you can get at home improvement stores. Um, it's attached on the rib, um, each rib, and those are four foot ribs, with just a, a, a metal clip. And then it's just attached with chain and an S-hook to the front of the shelf. And I've got another picture of this later in the presentation that shows it a little bit better. But what that allows us to do is use the high, sides of the high tunnel for um, hardening crops off. But when those shelves aren't in use, they fold up and the chain just goes around the outside of them and they fold up out of the way um, because it definitely cuts down on your on your workspace there but when we can when we can have those shelves up it keeps those transplants up off the ground um, increases your airflow and and it just works beautifully for us so that's probably our number one best high tunnel idea um, patch tape is an excellent idea if you have a high tunnel you ought to have patch tape on hand when you order the high tunnel just order the roll of patch tape if it doesn't come with it because um, like i said crew members with with hose uh, dogs rabbits um, runaway tillers anything is going to ding up the the plastic on your high tunnels and especially if you have um, the double layer of plastic with the inflation fan uh, you instantly lose all your efficiency if it's blown through a hole in your plastic. So the, the patch tape is an excellent thing to have on hand. Um, a thermostat, I, I mentioned that we're passive solar for our high tunnels. We do have electricity run to them and uh, for two reasons alone. Um, we do have a thermostatically controlled vent fan that kicks on obviously at whatever temperature we set it at and then runs our ceiling fans. And we go to the uh, Habitat for Humanity store, we buy you know, $5, $10 used ceiling fans to put in the high tunnels, and they last six, eight years, which is a great use of 10 bucks, and um, that works really well for us. But that thermostatically controlled vent fan has saved us any number of times when we've been at farmer's market or off the farm and the weather changes unexpectedly. If it's supposed to be overcast all day and we've left the high tunnel 
closed up and suddenly the sun comes out and there's nobody on the farm, you can really devastate a lot of transplants that are hardening off in your high tunnel in April um, because a sunny day has, has broken through that you didn't expect and it's 110 degrees in your high tunnel. So having that, that thermostatically controlled vent fan is very important. Uh, Dolores just asked if we do the two layer with inflation fan. We do on all three of our tunnels um, use the double layer with the inflation fan. And for us, um, people ask if it's better or not. One of the things that I like the most about it is that it keeps the plastic taut so that um, in a breeze it's not slamming around on the frame. And honestly, that's that's probably my favorite reason for having them. I'm not sure that's a good enough reason to put an extra layer of plastic on, but but that's my story, and I'm sticking to it. Uh, one of our best ideas, one of the best things, um, best ideas put to use is is building a high tunnel. It's been very important in a, on our farm. Um, it's an insurance policy. Uh, we replicate crops that we have in the high tunnel with crops that are in the field in all but deep winter and the number of times that something has gone wrong be it a herbicide drift in the field be it a weather issue be it a pest issue um, having that offset that insurance policy of that crop duplicated even in smaller amounts in the high tunnel has saved us I don't know how many times um, I, I tell people as long as we are vegetable farmers, I never want to do it without high tunnels, but I absolutely would never do it exclusively in high tunnels. Um, and the number one best idea um, with having to do with high tunnels is insure them. Um, I've had different people say that their insurance company won't cover theirs. Uh, we use Farm Bureau. They do all of our farm um, insurance policies and they do cover our high tunnels. We've had two major claims and a small claim against our high tunnels and they've never blinked. They've covered them um, and gone above and beyond on covering them. So um, we, we are proof that you need to have those things insured one way or another. Uh, I did want to point out some of the other little red arrows on the photos, other things that, that uh, have been important to us. Um, the photo on the left is me broad forking in the bed. I think broad forks are excellent in high tunnels. Um, we don't use them in the field simply because um, I, there's just too much territory to cover. But uh, we do use them in the high tunnels and they, they work great for us. The other little red arrow in that left photo is um, pointing to the deer netting. And this is one of our straight side high tunnels so that the deer netting is very effective there. Um, the, top right picture that's uh, drainage we were putting in a tile line between those two high tunnels and you'll notice that that tile line went in after the high tunnels did um, not really when I would recommend doing it but anytime you can add drainage around a high tunnel is a good time to do it uh, bottom left photo the arrows you can, one of the the centermost arrow is pointing at um, the irrigation that we use for our salad mix beds and we are almost exclusively a, a drip tape irrigation farm. I'm very dedicated to my drip tape um, but we do intensively plant salad mix beds and drip tape doesn't work for those so we use risers with a little little tiny mini sprinkler that uh, will do a 180 degree um, uh, spray pattern and in the high tunnel, man, those things work great. They don't have enough power in the field. Um, if there's any breeze, it, it blows the mist around too much. But in the high tunnel, that has worked really well and has saved me a lot of hand watering time. Uh, on the bottom of that same photo, it's hard to see, but you can just see a silver line um, up in the corner of the photo. And we use uh, low tunnels in our high tunnels for our overwintered crops and the way that we structure those is I do like to have a wire hoop or some people call them wickets over the bed rather than having the row cover directly on the crop. Um, we make sure that we don't get any abrasion damage, gives us a little more, a little more uh, insulation with the air above that. But 
the thing that we have found is in the high tunnels with our wider beds, these are four foot beds, a square top wicket works better than a round top one that we use in the field. Um, and those work very nicely for us. We use a Agrabon 19 on our high tunnel crops when it gets cold. When it gets really cold, we just add a second layer over the top of them. Uh, somebody's Ben's asking where we get our misters from. I believe those came from drip. I'm, I'm sure those came from Dripworks. Uh, the photo on the right shows uh, how we used to harden off our transplants. You can see some of our onion transplants laying right on the bed on top of the drip tape. Um, not, not how we harden them off anymore. We, <laughs> that I believe was an emergency situation. Um, but you can see the, the crops lined up along that wire shelving along the side of the high tunnel. Like I said, I think that's probably my best high tunnel idea to date. This would be my second best high tunnel idea um, and, and more proof that we can learn. After 10 years, you'd think that we'd be learning all sorts of exciting things and putting it into practice. Um, this strange looking creature right here, the green arrow. Um, all this is is a 10 foot length of conduit with a very fancy pipe clamp here at the top and a loop of uh, plastic plumber's strap. And <laughs> this is how we hang trellis lines in our high tunnel when we want a trellis um, when we're not in the center bed and we can't use that center row of pipes in our Hortnova. Uh, we rotate to a bed that's below a purlin, and we want to string uh, trellis strings up to our purlin. The first year we did that, I spent a whole lot of time trying to get a ladder over the top of the bed, and uh, it, it, was, it was a mess, and it took an enormous amount of time and made me grouchy. So I came up with our, our uh, trellising pole, which is what this piece of conduit is. So you take your trellis string, and you run it through the loop on the top of the trellising pole, and then you tie it to something heavy, like a great big three-inch washer or a really heavy, um, heavy gauge machine nut uh, with just a simple overhand knot. You then raise your piece of conduit up here over your purlin pipe there on the bottom left, and while you're holding on to the string, you just, because the plastic plumber strap is flexible, you slide it between the plastic and the purlin pipe, and then you let the tension go on the string. So the weight drops it back down to the ground. You've got both ends of the string. You tie it off to whatever you're going to tie it off to. Cut it, pull your, pull your line off, or pull your conduit out, and go on to the next position. Um, this has probably saved us, I don't know, 200% on labor hours when we have to string trellis in the high tunnels. Um, once you kind of get the hang of it, it's fast, it's quick, it's dirt cheap, which is my favorite solution, um, and it works great. And then when, you know, something catches on your, your ceiling fan in your high tunnel or whatever, you can use your little loop tool to remove it. So we, we always have this hanging in our high tunnel. Um, on the uh, top right photo, you can see in the back um, an example back here of our trellising that we use on the back wall. It's just a couple of, of livestock panels stacked together, put up with washers and lag bolted to the framework on the end of the tunnel. Um, very stable. In fact, it's stable enough that I can climb up it, which is handy when the cucumbers are suddenly 12 feet in the air. Um, so that's worked very well. You can also see, this is a better photo of that uh, shelving on the side of the tunnel. Um, you can see it in its down position where we are hardening off some kale and then the section that we didn't need. I believe these come in 12 foot um, shelving sections, which is great if you have four foot spacing on your, on your ribs in your high tunnel. And like I said, it just folds up. We unhook the S hook from the outside edge of the shelf wrap it around the top of the shelf, chain it to itself, and it stays in the up position out of the way. It's lightweight, it's handy. I will warn you though, or caution you, um, the shelving, um, if you get it from the, the home improvement stores, it comes with plastic clips. 
don't buy the plastic clips. Go online and order, um, I think it's Shelf Made is the brand, um, actually makes a, a metal clip instead of a plastic one. The, the plastic ones work, but they'll only last a couple seasons. And when you have, uh, you know, 700 of your uh, four inch tomato transplants loaded on those shelves and those clips fail, you will hate yourself and you will say, gee, I wish I'd bought those metal clips. So do yourself a favor if you're looking at this kind of shelving and go for the metal clips. It will make your life much easier. Uh, finally, this is something that, that we, we learned after putting up several high tunnels and doing it poorly. Um, the anti-billowing rope on high tunnels, um, different manufacturers use different grades of rope, whatever. The thing that we learned about them is there is absolutely no reason to make the entire rope all here over this whole section. Don't make that all one length of rope. You will hate yourself. It's a pain in the butt to pull. What we do is we divide the high tunnel into quarters and we start our line down at the bottom. We tie it off. We do approximately, you know, three or four of these rotations. And when you get down to this bolt, cut the string, tie it off, start a new string, tie it to the same bolt and run your next four uh, repetitions of that cut your string, tie it off, so that when your line fails, which at some point it will, it's usually at the least opportune time, you don't lose your entire um, anti-billow structure. You'll only lose one section. Uh, and we, I can't tell you how many times we've been out in terrible, horrible, windy, nasty weather trying desperately to catch the pipe that's flying around attached to the plastic because our anti-billow rope has broken. So doing that in multiple sections has has been a Im very important lesson that we finally learned. These are some of our less than stellar ideas and I share these to prove that we can learn and uh, in hopes that that you won't do them. Um, I mentioned that we use Hortnova um, as a trellis in our large tunnel on those um, prefab excuse me prefabricated center posts which work spectacularly do pay attention um, put a tag on it or something that marks what year because we left ours in place for four years and we should have only left it in place for three years um, we had uh, 10 foot tall tomato plants the entire length of the high tunnel hanging on that trellis when it failed and when it came down, it not only made an enormous mess, but it made harvesting for the rest of the season an absolute nightmare. Um, and we had we had strung our, our Hortnova on aircraft cable, um, which I thought was going to be strong enough, and it was, but the Hortnova wasn't. Um, so Hortnova is great. Whatever um, plastic trellising system you want to use is great. Uh, but if you're going to leave it up for multiple seasons, do yourself a favor and make a tag and write on it what year it is because you always think oh I just did that last year and time goes by fast. Uh, animal based compost in high tunnels. Um, I'm sure that there is a way to do that well if you're one of the lucky people that have a lot of flat land and you can move your high tunnel um, to one of multiple uh, positions you can get away with animal based compost. If you are uh, someone like us and you have a stationary high tunnel, I would say uh, on our farm under no conditions will we ever again put even beautifully finished um, co animal based compost in our high tunnels because of that soil salinity issue. Uh, it's just not worth the fight um, because because of the type of irrigation we do, it's always going to be an issue. So don't make your life harder with that. Um, spring tooth harrows, uh, this is something that I tell people more so they can laugh at how absolutely silly we can be than that anyone else would be dumb enough to try this. But uh, in our large tunnel, um, our previously large tunnel, uh, here on the right is the uh, colossal tunnel. And we had some soil compaction issues from construction when we were building that tunnel and really wanted to, to loosen up that soil. Um, and we had a small spring tooth harrow section that we thought that we could use. Um, 
but the end wall structure was already partially in place so we couldn't take a tractor through there at that stage so uh, someone in my family came up with the great idea that we would um, tie the spring tooth harrow on a very long rope um, a 50 plus foot rope uh, so that it would run the full length of the tunnel and then we would tie it to our utility vehicle and uh, pull it through the the tunnel with the utility vehicle just starting at the edge of the tunnel and driving 50 feet away and we had plenty of clearance at the end of the tunnel however communication being what it is and utility vehicles being kind of loud there was a miscommunication um, blip and uh, needless to say we took out the baseboard with the spring tooth harrow when the driver didn't stop soon enough uh, so Remember that your high tunnel is uh, expensive and high value territory and don't let people do silly things in them. Uh, be very aware of your prevailing winds when you're looking at lo locating your high tunnel. Um, that seems like kind of an obvious statement and some people get really worked up over which orientation is better for high tunnels. If you want north south on your long side, east west on your long side. Um, I would say our experience has been, and in talking to a lot of other growers, wind pressure is more important than sun when it comes to a structure like this. Um, they, unless you have solid ends. Uh, as long as your, your end walls are at least translucent, if not transparent, um, the sun will get into them. The wind, on the other hand, will also get into them, and you want to be very aware of how the wind is stressing your structure. Um, so just add that into your into your calculations when you're looking at possibilities. When we first started with high tunnels, Farm Tech was kind of one of the one of the early uh, manufacturers in that, and that's like I said, that's what we went with. Um, I don't know if they still are, but when they originally were manufacturing tunnels, the end walls had zippers in them, um, and I don't care what you manufacture zippers for they are not strong enough to withstand the wear and tear that high tunnels get um, it was definitely the weakest link we never used our zippers um, our we permanently framed in our end walls but those continued to be the weakest point of our high tunnels and we ended up having to do all sorts of strange remediation to try and gap across those zippers when they failed even though we weren't using them um, they're just a weak point so if you can avoid zippers, I would recommend it. Insect screening was was um, almost as bad an idea as the spring tooth harrow in the high tunnel. Uh, we were really fighting um, cucumber beetles are a terrible, terrible problem on our farm. And I was bound and determined that we were going to find a way to exclude them from our high tunnels. So we bought um, from Farm Tech some really nice white insect screening that ran the entire length of the high tunnels under the roll-up sides and they did an exceptional job for two seasons at least of of excluding cucumber beetle um, the problem is that they so desperately cut down on your your airflow um, the crew hated working in that high tunnel i hated working in that high tunnel we had more trouble with with downy mildew in that high tunnel it was just a nightmare my happiest day was the day that we tore the insect screen back out um, besides the fact that once the cucumber beetles got in then they multiplied inside and they couldn't get out because we had the side screened um, so i i would really unless you have a great reason for wanting insect screening i would say um, airflow is more important than insect screening uh, Donna has a question about fungus gnat. We do not tend to have much of an issue with fungus gnat on our farm, and I don't have a good explanation for why. Um, so I, I don't have any advice for a control on that. I'm sorry. Um, finally, one of our less than stellar ideas is building a high tunnel. Um, there aren't a lot of things on our farm that over the years have caused more stress. Uh, so I would say, especially now that it's possible to uh, get some subsidies for high tunnels. I know lots and lots of people are putting them up. Um, be aware that they are not without their significant challenges. Um, 
a lot of times high tunnels have that first two or three year honeymoon period where everything grows and it goes well and it's beautiful and glorious and that's all well and good until you have an issue and suddenly you have a serious issue and it spirals out of control. Uh, that for me was a real wake up call. I kind of thought that that Pollyanna period was permanent and uh, my my naivete about high tunnels was significant. So it, it was a, a significant lesson for me that that uh, they are not for the faint of heart. Um, the photo on the on the bottom left my arrow's not working. Uh, bottom left is pointing at a very healthy zucchini planting. This was uh, the reason that we put the insect screening in to start with was that I was trying to see if we could extend our zucchini period because our losses tend to be so high in them. Uh, and it was very successful. In fact, even though we grow, grew bush zucchini varieties, um, by the time that uh, we were about halfway into the season, they were so huge that the plants were actually climbing up the walls and twice during the season I needed to go in with a machete and uh, cut my way into the tunnel because they were so out of control. Um, we did have very nice zucchini production in there, but uh, high tunnels are expensive territory and you need to put your high value crops or your very high demand crops in a high tunnel and the the zucchini for us was really a uh, waste of time and money and effort. It was kind of an interesting experiment to do once, but really you want to look at those high value crops for your high tunnel. Uh, the center photo on the bottom uh, shows a couple tools that we used to use in our high tunnel. Um, we really don't use either one of those tools in there anymore. Uh, I, I caution people about using internal combustion engines in high tunnels um, for a couple reasons. One, if it's the uh, mild part of the season and you can have that high tunnel wide open great um, if it's not mid-season or a warm part of the season and for some reason you feel the need to have that high tunnel closed up uh, you can really give yourself one heck of an air quality headache um, I try very hard to to not use uh, the tillers in our high tunnels um, I generally do it when we first erect them and go in and prep the soil and then I try not to put uh, engines back in my high tunnel if at all possible. I don't think it's good for for the operator nor the uh, the plastic. You get a lot of, of uh, off gassing in there. Um, hand tools are really great in the high tunnel. Like I said we use broad fork, we use a lot of wheel hose um, of different different types in there. Um, I, I feel like that's a better use of our of our energy and, and better honoring of our health uh, by not putting those engines in there. Uh, the final bottom right photo is us grading because for even for the uh, uh, 42 by 48 foot high tunnel which isn't very long uh, we still had to do quite a bit of grading work because we just didn't have flat ground and when we set up the pad for our grading uh, we used some fill with some really big rocks in it to fill the, the lowest portion of the grade and it was a really bad idea. Um, through, through time uh, we now hit that, hit those rocks with our broad fork and uh, the plants sometimes bottom out at them so uh, make sure if you're filling, you're filling, you know what's going into your fill. That, that was not an educated decision on my part. Uh, Kathy's asking what our primary fertilizer is in the tunnels. Uh, currently, we are generally using uh, dried kelp and dried fish. Um, we do occasionally do some some foliar feeding on demand, but generally uh, it's not a, a regular practice for us. Uh, very quickly, since we're coming to the end of our hour, um, Steve had mentioned that we did a... Uh, a three season study for PFI on high tunnel profitability where we tracked every expense coming in and going out of the high tunnel um, including uh, uh, labor hours and crop sales and 
what we were looking at was what what's the turnaround on a high tunnel. So in 2008 when we were doing this and when we replaced both of those original high tunnels, these were our costs on the high tunnel. And you can see that we figured out what our cost per square foot on uh, the smaller tunnel was 361 per square feet, 332 per square foot for uh, that colossal high tunnel. Um, just to give you a comparison, here is the high tunnel that we just completed for Nolts. Uh, and we do still have, um, you can see here, some outstanding expenses that haven't gone out. We're anticipating those will be about $500. But you can see our, our cost per square foot was $282, um, which I like better than the, the uh, previous two numbers of, of a little over three and a half. Um, and a little less than three and a half. Um, this is all uh, uh, self-built, so we we didn't bring any contractors in. We have have uh, uh, fortunately have those skills on our farm. We're able to do the groundwork and all of the construction um, ourselves, and with the help of willing friends. Uh, going back to that PFI study. Oh, sorry, I thought I had it on here. Um, we. Uh, through through those three seasons when we were tracking all of that information, uh, the thing that uh, we figured out was that we paid off the entire capital investment for those two original high tunnels in a period of 16 months. So it took 16 months for those tunnels to pay for themselves and then start to earn a profit. Um, we had replaced plastic on one of them uh, after a hailstorm, which was the small claim for our insurance company. Um, but that was outside of that 16 month period. So they haven't incurred a lot of additional cost uh, with the exclusion of um, when the tornado hit them and they died. So that's kind of our, our quick scan at um, if you're planting, if you're making smart decisions about what you're planting in your high tunnel, because that is high value real estate, the tunnels can pay for themselves, we found in as little as 16 months. Uh, somebody's asking for more time on the budget page. I'll let you scan back across that. Um, that is kind of the, the uh, fast talk on our high tunnel, so I will certainly open it up for questions. Um, what, let's see, I answered the primary fertilizer question. Have you had trouble growing cucumbers in the high tunnel? Um, less problems than we have had growing them in the field. Uh, we've generally had had quite good success growing high tunnels, or excuse me, cucumbers in the high tunnel. Um, the uh, cucumber beetles are, uh, like I said, a significant problem on our farm. Um, we have a very, very large pumpkin patch less than a mile away, and uh, we kind of feel like they are a, a vector for those, and uh, when they hit the chemical stream down at the pumpkin patch, they turn around and come to our place. So we, we do have a lot of cucumber beetles. Uh, and uh, Mike Eaton, I'm, uh, really for us, the, the extent of our problems were, were the cucumber beetles. So I'm not sure if, if you're asking about, in addition to that, uh, additional problems growing cukes in the high tunnel, or, or if you have other questions about that. Uh, does PFI have the high tunnel productivity data available, yes, and Steve put that link up for the uh, um, field trial archives back at the beginning. And so if you go to the, to the PFI website and look up their trial data archives, um, that, that study information is available. And that, I believe it's published as maybe two separate two or three separate studies because we were doing it on a seasonal, season by season basis. Does anyone else have, oh, it looks like there are folks typing, if people have other questions. Um, I, I do want to take the opportunity to uh, thank Steve and uh, also Lauren who provided the uh, ISU Extension office for me here this evening and Steve for running the the uh, webinar. I certainly appreciate their help and also some photo credits to Tammy Fox and Deb Draper who were kind enough to share some photos of that new high tunnel when they were helping on our build. 
Amanda wants to know if we can recommend a size of tunnel for a first tunnel. You know, our first tunnel was 12 by 24, um, and we built it out of rebar and water pipe and construction plastic from Menards, which I don't recommend. Um, the plastic, that is. The rest of it was fine. It's it's whatever size you have available. Um, you will always wish that your high tunnel was bigger, has been my experience. So maximize whatever space you have available. But as a training high tunnel, that 12 by 24 was great, and we ate out of it all winter long. What are we using for bowl control? Um, there are uh, multiple things. Um, we, we don't use any poison on our farm. I'd really love to occasionally. Uh, we have dogs which are helpful around the perimeter of the high tunnel. Um, we do uh, line traps inside the high tunnel where we will actually line up uh, within a box multiple traps. There are some really nice designs online. Elliot Coleman had some had kind of a nice um, enclosed wooden box system for traps inside and you put a hole on each end so that they have to go through it. Um, I've also seen people pretty effectively use uh, like four inch PVC pipe along the um, and just put short sections, two to four foot sections, but you put the traps inside the pipe and you put it against the wall since a lot of times they travel along the perimeters, um, but then they can't, they can't avoid the traps once they're in the tube. So um, that's, that's really helpful. I also saw somebody who used actually a bend, um, so used a, an elbow for PVC and hooked it to the pipe and then put the elbow down into the access hole where they knew that people, or that people, <laughs> that voles were, were accessing the high tunnel um, so that it, it actually forced them to go past the trap. And that looks like that was pretty successful too. Um, bait in the traps, you know, uh, I think they were putting naked traps in those, in the uh, PVC tubing traps um, because once, as long as you have the trap set, it actually doesn't have to be baited. They just have to cross the line. Um, we were baiting ours um, that we were setting up in a line with peanut butter, which worked great until um, our two-year-old dog decided that the scent of peanut butter was more compelling than the rule that there were no dogs allowed in the high tunnel, and he ate my traps. Um, so I've, I've heard different, different things. Some people talk about wiring an almond or a peanut onto the trap. Rather than peanut butter, peanut butter seemed to have worked okay for us, but it is a constant battle. Uh, let's see. Um, Mike was asking what crops we plant at the outer edges. We um, sal uh, Salad mix is a pretty important crop for us, and we plant edible flowers for our salad mix along the perimeter. So a lot of times we'll have nasturtiums and violas along the perimeter. I also do um, uh, seedling garlic along the edges. Um, it works a, a bit as a deterrent. Um, evidently thrips don't like it. Aphids are supposed to not like it. Uh, I'm hoping that it's a slight deterrent for our rabbits along the edges there. Um, so on our garlic crop, when we occasionally miss a garlic scape and it sets up the little bobiles, we take those and we just toss them all along the edges of the high tunnel. And then you get a really nice baby green garlic crop if you want it, and uh, um, it seems to, it's not a bad crop to have along there. Uh, I have to say that very often chickweed is the predominant crop we have on the perimeters of the high tunnel, which is great because it's edible, but it is a giant pain in the butt. Uh, Steve was asking, do we do cover crops in the high tunnels? Um, poorly, yes. Um, we occasionally have had um, uh, so much success with our cover crop in the high tunnel that it got away from us and then was a control issue. Um, I've done oats and peas in the high tunnel. The thing I find is that we never have enough high tunnel real estate to begin with, so setting aside an entire section of a season for cover crop in the tunnel for me is a bit of a challenge. Um, mostly because I'm not an excellent manager of cover crops. So we have done it. Um, we don't do it particularly well. I'd, I'd love to chat with someone who, who does it well. 
Well, hello there, Dean Henry. Are the shelves purchased or made from panels? Uh, they're they're purchased. We use the 12. Now I can't remember if it's the 12 or 16. I believe it's the 12 inch shelf um, from Rubbermaid that comes from Menards or Home Depot, and they come in 12 foot sections and uh, have been very useful for us. So let's see. Oh, it looks like we've got more people typing, so we can have more, more good questions. Yeah, definitely um, keep the questions coming. Thank you, Jill, for a great presentation, and we'll take we'll we'll keep you occupied until 8:30 if there are still questions. If that's all right, we've got some good questions so far. Good. Let's do it. Jack Davis, let's see, is your new high tunnel larger than the one we lost? Yes, it absolutely is. Um, the tunnel that we lost was uh, 42 by 48 from Farm Tech, and our current new tunnel is a 30 by 96 from Knowles. So we gained about a third again as much space. Do we ever use our BCS in the high tunnel, or does that go back to the combustion issue? Um, I did actually just this week use our BCS tiller in our new big tunnel for our original till-in um, just to get the beds in good shape. Uh, it will probably be the last time I use my BCS tiller in the high tunnel. Um, I just, I first of all, it's big, and we really try and maximize our high tunnel space in those permanent beds. It doesn't give much working space on the ends of the high tunnel, so it's hard to get a, a tiller that big turned around and back into the bed without wreaking havoc. Um, so I prefer not to use it in there if I can at all help it. This is fun. I know some of the people that are joining us this evening have been on our farm and have been in our high tunnels and can can attest to the fact that, that uh, um, a lot of this is proof we can learn because our systems are not impeccable. We are always trying to learn how to do do things better all over the farm, but certainly in the high tunnels. If anyone is interested in high tunnel manufacturers, um, I have to say that uh, I've now been a part of builds on three different manufacturers. Um, our our uh, several tunnels that we put up from Farm Tech. Um, I've been on a build for uh, Four Seasons Tool High Tunnel and also for the Nolts High Tunnel. And um, in the past, we had been fairly pleased with Farm Tech. They had good service. They were always very willing to answer our questions, and and um, their engineers would help on on problems that we had. Uh, now that we've got the Nolts high tunnel um, erected, I think the uh, the grade of steel, the uh, stability of the structure is quite a bit better. Um, it's also a Gothic style rather than a Quonset style high tunnel, so I think the engineering on it is better. Um, but I was very, very pleased with the materials, um, And but both companies have had really good customer service. If you are new to the world of high tunnels, I would recommend if you can get on a build for someone else's tunnel before you erect your own, it will make your life much, much easier. Uh, and if you are investigating a tunnel from Nolts, um, if you are not well versed in high tunnel construction or construction in general, uh, find someone who is to help you build that high tunnel because their instructions are dreadful. Let's see, back to the fertilizer. We said kelp and fish. Am I guessing on quantity or using soil samples? Um, we do soil sample. Um, mostly I go on a kind of industry standard for, for application rates for my high tunnels. I can't tell you off that I have a cheat sheet that I use for my different bed sizes. Um, for application rates, but I, I generally do kind of an industry standard, and I generally do that twice a season when we're switching um, crops over in our high tunnels. Um, we do soil sample, though. I just don't soil sample um, 
more than once every couple years. And Dolores is asking about construction of the end walls and did we concrete in the ribs bows? That's an excellent question. Um, the construction of the end walls on our high tunnels, we, uh, we frame ours in permanently, so we're not making them accessible for large equipment. Um, just as a personal choice, that's not how we farm. Um, we do not concrete in our ribs, but we do aggressively concrete in our end walls, all of the verticals on our end walls. Um, when we lost the earlier tunnels, uh, we had the most outside post and the center post concreted in, and when that high tunnel went airborne, it took um, about a 90 pound chunk of concrete right out of the ground. Uh, so we determined that um, having that entire end wall structure concreted in was a good investment uh, on our sanity. And I'm not sure if I answered all of Dolores's question or not. So Dolores, uh, shoot a second question if you have more would like more details on that. Jill, uh, Jill, I'm I'm seeing your microphone icon, but I'm not hearing you, your voice right now. I'm not sure if anybody else is having that issue. I, s I expect you're answering Donna's question about the irrigation lines. I was. Can I you hear me now? I, oh, now I can hear you. Yep. Hmm. I I apologize. I'll I'll repeat what I was saying in case that was uh, system wide. Um, we one of the things we learned was that the hydrant should go inside the high tunnel if at all possible rather than outside and we now plant one dedicated inside each high tunnel that we erect. Um, we haven't had a problem with irrigation lines freezing systemically as long as that hydrant is inside. When it was external it was a real problem for us. Anybody have any additional questions? It looks like we've still got about 10 minutes to play with if you do. Yeah, it's kind of looking like I don't I don't see any other um, folks chatting uh, in the chat box. Oh, here's one from Dolores. Oh, uh, oh, Dolores, oh. which picture? Oh, up oh, at the yeah, top. Oh yeah, Percy. <laughs> Percy. That's, that's Percy. Percy. Um, we have alpaca on our farm, uh, and that that's Percy when he was about oh probably four months old. So he was. He is our, our young alpaca. He is now uh, 15 months old and as ornery as he could be. But yes, that's, that's Percy and I up in the top left of the screen. Good, que good question, Dolores. That was um, a good question. So yeah, I think unless Jack has a question here, this might be it. Um, really great information, Jill. Thank you so much for sharing all the all your experiences, the good and the bad. Obviously, um, the, the the things that you've learned from are things that everyone else can learn from. So we really appreciate uh, you opening up like that. So 
Um, again, we'll have this uh, recorded in our archives by the end of the week, so if you want to share this with, um, with anyone else you think that would benefit from it, feel free to find it in our archives and use the link. Um, there is, I, I did put up that survey uh, link in the middle of the screen there. If you don't mind um, filling out a little bit of feedback for Practical Farmers of Iowa, we would appreciate it. But it does look like the questions have, have fizzled out. So, uh, Jill, thank you so much. This was really great. I appreciate it. And thanks, everybody, for tuning in. We'll be back next Tuesday and then pretty much every Tuesday um, for the rest of the winter. Thank you, everyone. It was a pleasure getting to chat with you. If you uh, have other questions, you're welcome to contact me via our website, or you can also find us, Bluegate Farm, on Facebook, and uh, shoot me additional questions. Or Otherwise, we hope to catch up with you at the PFI conference. Thanks again, Steve, and y'all have a great evening.